The second question from the chat is, how did you develop your supervision style? Did it evolve or did you get training or how did you go about it? Um, I think it just evolved. You're probably better off asking my PhD students, to be honest. Um, I mean, I had, <laughs> I had a, I, I think I had a good PhD supervisor, so I like to take um, aspects of my own like PhD process and apply them to my supervision style. Um, and then I, I guess I, I try to avoid the bits that I didn't like and build and improve those. Um, so I guess it's been, yeah, pretty much um, an evolution through time. I mean, there is training available. I did go to a couple training sessions about um, supervisory tips and techniques and stuff. Um, but to be honest, I can't actually remember taking much away from them. I think it's more just uh, give it a go and see how it see how it works out. And I think the main thing is to have a good um, communication channel with your students, so you're quite open about how things are going in both directions. Right. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Yes, I would like to add something about... Uh, ah, sorry, Julia. I, I didn't it's okay, go ahead, go ahead. No, uh, um, I think it's just to be... For example, to be me, I mean. I, I remember with my co-advisor of, of PhD, uh, just like one hour or two hours before my, my, um, uh, my thesis defense, I mean, um, I, I wanted to, to practice a lot of uh, times the presentation and he just told me, he's Italian, <laughs> he just told me, let's go for a coffee and you, you need to be relaxed and to be happy and you live, live your life. And so I think it's, it's for me, it's obviously to have um, very clear the objective with the students um, but, and maybe a, a schedule that uh, put some times in the, in the, uh, I mean, in the objective, but, uh, um, I think it's just to be human to to talk with uh, I mean every topic to to live uh, with them in a normal way and not in a in a really really rigid or formal way. That is uh, for me that the way. But uh, I I'm very new in this. <laughs> Julia, you wanted to add something? I just I wanted to say that uh, for me, uh, like. Watching other people have been a great inspiration and especially former mentors of mine that I thought were very, uh, had a specific way of doing things. And I think, well, you need to have a little bit of um, sensit sensitivity with it. Yeah. Um, and trying to also to adapt to the personality of the people you're working with. And, and also to remember what didn't work for you when you were supervised by other people. So it's definitely you're working, you're, you're learning along the way. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen, anything else to add? They covered it completely uh, no. and uh, it's good. All right, so, uh, um, Oh, this is an interesting question. Um, I don't know who will want to go first, but I'll just read it out and then one of you can have a go. How did you, did you decide where to settle? Did you try to stay in your home country or was your partner or family a decisive point in choosing where you are currently or where you decided that you would want to be? So who's gonna have a go at that one? I'm seeing smiles, so. <laughs> I can uh, just talk about my case, but I think it's very, it depends on the person and their family situation. But about my case, mm -hmm. I didn't, I hadn't decided where I want to settle. I was already living abroad away from France. Uh, I had applied to different positions and it's more like the fact that I got this job, this, op this opportunity. And for me, it was my dream job. It made me decide to stay in the US. So it wasn't really a, an active decision so I went where the job I wanted was um, yeah that's my personal uh, experience Julia uh, yeah for me the experience was a bit different and 
I agree with Ellen though that it is a lot about opportunities and it's hard to decide in advance how you want things to be. Um, there was a time where I was in the UK and fairly happy and uh, if uh, things had worked out there, perhaps I would still be there. But then I came back to France and for me it was more there was a threshold. Like I had, I had moved several times around the world and, and there was a time where I decided that I, I didn't want to move again. And it was too much effort and uh, it was also, it was also a strain on my partner. So, um, so I decided to stay in France and, and that obviously brought some difficulties <laughs> um, because uh, if you're becoming picky about the, the locate where you want to be, uh, it means also you're reducing the opportunities for permanent jobs. So um, I think it, it will be, everyone will have a different story and obviously family is, uh, is adding to the to the difficulties in uh, trying to find a position and making everyone uh, happy. So um, yeah, that's just about me. But I can't I can't say it is uh, like I I I made my like I decided on this path after my PhD. It's more that I I, I did several postdocs and then like I had some opportunities and in the end it worked out uh, this way. Mm -hmm. James? I mean, I have a, a different story again. And I think if you ask any academic, they're going to have a different story. It's, I guess it's all to do with opportunities and then any filters or limits that you put on upon yourself according to the life you want to live. So, I mean, for me, um, when I was finishing my PhD and doing a bit of postdoc time, um, I had a girlfriend at the time and she was also doing a PhD. She's a vol well, she was a volcano geophysicist as well. And we both just basically said that whoever gets a permanent job first will just go there and then the other person will figure it out. Um, and that happened to be me. Um, and I was quite lucky to get this position, I think, um, in terms of the location, because I... I've always grown up near the coast and I now have a permanent position by the coast and I'm actually just uh, an hour and a half drive from where I was born as a kid. So um, in that regard, yeah, I got very lucky. Um, but it was just a case of opportune timing. I was actually about to leave academia um, when this job opportunity came up and then I was like, huh, might as well apply. And then here I am four, four years later. So... Yeah, I guess it's just, everyone's got an individual story, but you do you, do what's best for you. Exactly, Mariana, anything? No, I think uh, it's, it's the same. I mean, we, we all have uh, different histories. And um, I, when I was working after the PhD here, I started to apply to a lot of countries just to have the opportunity to have a fixed position. I was not thinking in the place, but I applied to New Zealand, to France, to Spain. And I was really in the, um, with a lot of uncertainty in that time, but uh, I was just uh, waiting for some fixed position. At the end, I had the fixed position here, but um, yeah, I was looking for the opportunity, just that. Right, so I guess it all comes down to luck on your individual experiences and that kind of type of thing and it's always interesting it's always interesting to hear stories from different people because you realize although we may be in a very broad field but it's similar it, everyone has a unique way of getting into here and staying in um so next question for those of you that teach how did um did you need to get a lot of teaching experience to get your position or um how did you go about getting that experience to assist you in that teaching criteria so and Mariana I think you mentioned something with students and James as well so I don't know if you guys want to have a go at that question so did you get experience beforehand teaching experience beforehand or go on Mariana <laughs> yeah. we, we start at the same time 
Well, I teach since I am, I was um, 15 years old, so I, I really like to teach. I know, I, I mean, I know colleagues that they don't like too much to teach, but uh, I really enjoy to teach. Um, I study with mathematics, physics, a lot of, of um, different science uh, topics. So when I started to do my master, I, here in Mexico, we have the opportunity to assist some professors during the, the classes. So since the baccalaureate, I was assisting some teachers, um, some professors. So for me to teach is like kind of for, um, part of my natural formation because I, I am like uh, learning uh, many times um, of the topics, but I am so learning from the students. So to deal with teaching for me is not to be, it's just to enjoy to teach, no? It's just to, to live with that part. And uh, here in the permanent position, I, am, I will be evaluate <laughs> the, number of, um, the number of courses that I have for semester. So now I need to plan that and to, to have the um, specific topics in that classes. But um, to... To teach for me is just uh, part of, I mean, of my formation. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but uh, I think that I, I didn't have like a drastic change in that. I was teaching since too many years ago, so it's kind of normal for me. Yeah, that kind of answers it quite well. James, do you have any, did you have a lot of experience beforehand or these four years your experience? Um, no, I, I don't think I did have very much experience, to be honest. I mean, while I was doing my PhD, I was uh, like a teaching assistant helping out in practical sessions. And I guess I gave a couple like lectures while I was doing my PhD as well, which I made a big deal about when I was applying for my job. I obviously wrote that on my CV as guest lecturer um, to, uh, to amplify that a little bit. But yeah, realistically, I didn't have very much experience. But what I'll, I would add to that is, at least in the UK, I feel like my cat is about to, okay. Um, in the UK, you, you realistically you don't need that much teaching experience um, if you're going into a, a research and teaching position. Most universities in the UK, um, when they're recruiting for a permanent academic position, they're most interested in your research output and how successful you've been in attracting research money. So I think you could probably get into a, an academic position in the UK with no teaching experience if you've got um, a pretty impressive research CV. Okay, interesting. Uh and um, yeah, so the last question that I'm seeing here is, and I think Ellen and Julia might be able to take this one quite well, is what are the main differences in Wiccan style between Europe and the Americas? How different is it between those two places? So Ellen, do you want to have a go at that first? Uh, okay, so it's hard to tell. I think it depends a lot on the kind of institution you're at or even which university of uh, for example, in the US or even Canada. Um, so some, some people might think that uh, in the US it's more competitive, but I think it really depends which university, which department you're at, if there's pressure on you to publish or not. Uh, for me uh, at Carnegie, it's a very supportive environment and I don't think uh, the working style is that different from a research institution uh, in in France at least, I don't know about the other European countries, because the research is very international, also the groups, the research groups are very international, so each postdoc, each uh, researcher has their own style. Um, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, Julia has more ideas about <laughs> how it, it compares. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure in working style, I think I think it depends on the position you're, it's more a question of are you going to be teaching or is it only research? Uh, but I think there are some differences in between the US. I think it's every country has specificities specifically related to the hiring processes. Um, so I know that in France, for example, uh, often um, uh, 
recruitment calls are nationwide uh, schemes, which means that uh, each department doesn't have a lot of weight in deciding uh, who, they, who they get. Um, while in the US and perhaps in the UK also, uh, institutions like universities are, are more independent and so they have their own uh, uh, calls for uh, positions. Uh, yeah, that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah, I agree about the hiring process completely different. <laughs> uh, mm. Hiring process, but the working style is not that different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, the tenure track, sorry, I forgot, but because uh, in the US there's this process called tenure track uh, professorship, where uh, professors uh, are not uh, immediately permanent professors, so they have five years to uh, do their research, publish, and after five years, they have to submit a package and be approved, be accepted to be a professor. So this tenure track is very specific to the US. Uh, I don't think in other countries it works like that. 